So let's finally talk about expectation for two random variables. And as we'll see, what makes the most sense here is to talk about the expected value of a function of these two random variables. So we've learned that the joint PMF or joint PDF provides a full uh, characterization of a pair of random variables. So that's a full probabilistic description of X and Y. But sometimes we might just be more interested in a quick summary via the average or expected value of a particular function, okay? And what this function is for now, we're just gonna leave um, kind of abstract, but in later videos, we'll see how to make this a bit more applied. So one approach is to first figure out what is the distribution of this function W, okay? And then from there, we can work out the expected value. But this can actually be pretty challenging. So determining the PDF or PMF of W can be pretty challenging and turns out to be unnecessary. Okay, if you're interested, you can see the lecture notes for examples of how to do this, but we're not gonna cover it. So what we're gonna do instead is to say the expected value of a function g of x, y is defined as in the discrete case, a sum over the values of that uh, function times the joint PDA, PMF, and in the continuous case, the expected value of that function is going to be the double integral of that function times the joint PDF integrated over x and y, okay? So that's the definition, and this g can be whatever we're interested in. We still have this nice property of linearity of expectation, and here we're gonna write it quite generally. So we're gonna say if you had lots of functions, g1 up to gn, and some constants a1 up to an, and then you're interested in the expectation of this sum a1, g1 up to an, gn, then you can break that up into a1 times the expected value of g1 plus all the way up to an times the expected value of gn. Okay, so basically all this means is you can break up expectation over these um, plus symbols. Why is this true? Well, in the discrete case, Let's just write out what this means. So it means I would take this big function weighted by the joint PMF, and then I would split this up into a bunch of sums, okay? And then I would just notice that each of these sums corresponds to the individual expectation of a function, okay? So it's very simple to see that this is true. In the continuous case, I would just replace these sums with integrals. The special cases you might see a lot are that the expected value of x plus y is just the expectation of x plus y, expectation of y, and expectation of ax plus by plus c is a times the expectation of x plus b times the expectation of y plus c. All right, and importantly, this linearity of expectation always holds, okay? So I don't need independence of the random variables to use this important property. I can always use it, I don't need to check any conditions. I can always break up expectation um, at the plus symbols. In contrast, if I have the expectation of a product, I can sometimes break it up. So if X and Y are independent, then for functions, let's say G of X and H of Y, I can take the expectation of GX, G of X and H of Y and break it up to the product of their individual expectations. Why is this true? Well, when I'm writing this product of functions times the joint PMF, then I can use independence to split up the joint PMF into the product of the marginals, then rearrange terms in the sum, and I'll see that I have the individual expectations there. And I can do the same in the continuous case by changing to integrals. So this doesn't hold in general, if I have dependent x and y, I really need independence. And if I manage to check that it holds in a particular case, so let's say this is true for a particular distribution, it does not necessarily mean that x and y are independent. They could still be dependent even if the expectation factors in a particular example. We'll see that in a minute. Okay, so we'll kind of wrap up this video just by working through some examples. And again, the application of this expectation we'll see in a later video. Okay, so let's say what I wanna do from this joint PMF table is to calculate the expectation of y squared. And notice that this doesn't involve x and that's fine. It is a function of x and y. It just happens to only depend on y. 
And instead of trying to compute the marginal of y, I can work with this joint PMF directly. So to get e of y squared, I just sum up over x and over y, y squared times the PMF, joint PMF in this case. Okay, and I'm gonna get minus one squared times PXY at minus one minus one. I'm gonna use all of those entries where I see minus one. So that there are three of them in this table where Y is equal to minus one. And then we're gonna get plus two squared and add up all of the entries in the second row. So all of the PMF entries in the second row where Y is equal to plus two. Okay, so then I'm gonna look at this table and sub in those values. So it's gonna be a third plus zero plus a twelfth plus four times a sixth plus a fourth plus a sixth. And I can put all of this together to get four plus one plus eight plus 12 plus eight over 12. Okay, that's gonna be 33 over 12, which is 11 over four. And we can actually compute the marginal if we want in this case, this is pretty simple. I just add up the rows and I get the marginal of y would be five twelfths for the first row and seven twelfths for the second row, okay? And now what I'm gonna do with this marginal is just double check that my double summation gave me the correct answer. So I'm gonna just double check this. You don't have to do this when you're computing something. I'm just showing you that it's true. So if I go to compute e of y squared using just the marginal of y, I have y squared times the PMF of y. And so that's gonna be minus one squared times five twelfths plus two squared times seven twelfths. That's gonna be five twelfths plus 28 twelfths, which is 33 twelfths. And you see that this is 11 fourths like before. Okay. As another example, let's do something that actually depends on x and y. So we're gonna calculate x squared times y. Okay, we don't have independence here. You can see that just by the fact that I have a zero entry that's not in an all zeros row or all zeros column. So I can't break up this product. Instead, what I have to do is just work out the double summation. It's tedious, but I'm just working out this for a pretty small example, so it should be okay. So I have x squared y times the joint PMF. And so I'm gonna have six different things to put in. So minus one squared times minus one, joint PMF at that value, minus plus one squared times minus one, again, joint PMF at plus one minus one, plus two squared times minus one, joint PMF at that value. So that was the first row. Going on to the second, I have minus one squared times uh, plus two, and then I have plus one squared times plus two, and then finally I have um, plus two squared times plus two, all times their joint PMF values. Okay, and so I'm gonna work out what these are. So I'm gonna have minus one times a third, the joint PMF value, minus one times zero, minus four times one twelfth, plus two times one sixth, plus two times one fourth, and plus eight times one sixth. And putting that all together, you can check I get minus four, minus four, plus four, six, and 16 all over 12. That's going to be 18 over 12, which is just three halves. Okay, and now what if we wanna calculate this function, e of four x squared minus y, minus y squared. Well, if that was what I was asked to do from the beginning and I have to work it out from the table, but because I already have these individual expectations, I can use linearity of expectation and just plug those in. So in this case, I know both of these individual terms, e of x squared y and e of y squared. Okay, so I'm just gonna plug those in. I'm gonna have four times three halves like we just worked out, minus 11 fourths from the previous slide. It's 24 minus 11 over four which is 13 over four. Okay, now let's work out some continuous examples. Okay, so here I'm gonna give you a joint PDF and I am going to uh, work out the expected value of some functions. So the joint PDF is just going to be um, equally likely to take any value in a circle of radius one. Okay, so here's my circle and it's equally likely that I fall anywhere in that circle. So first let's calculate the individual expected values e of x and e of y. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and do this using a double integral of x times the joint PDF of x, y, 
And I'm doing this instead of trying to get the marginal of x first, because it's often more convenient. It can be pretty annoying to get the marginal if I only want to get a specific uh, value like e of x. So let's just go ahead and compute the specific value. So in this case, I have this integration limit, which is constrained by the circle. And in order to satisfy the radius, I need that the x value goes from minus square root 1 minus y squared to plus square root 1 minus y squared. And you can convince yourself that if you have those integration limits and uh, y, then you'll always live within this circle. Okay, and y is then free as the outer limit to go from minus 1 to 1. And so I just plug in. And I could be done with this, but I'm going to go ahead and show you how it works out, okay? So I'm going to actually complete this integral, all right? And so I'm plugging in these square root values, and I'm going to get the integral from minus 1 to 1, 1 half times 1 minus y squared, minus 1 half, again, 1 minus y squared, dy. And so that's going to be 0. And I can see by symmetry, that's also equal to e of y. So if I had done the same integral for e of y, we've gotten the same answer. And so let's try to calculate e of xy. And we know from the range, since the range is not a rectangle, that x and y are dependent. And so I'm not allowed to factor this as e of x times e of y. So then I have to go ahead and compute this. So I'm going to go ahead and compute the double integral of xy times the joint PDF. The integration limits are going to be exactly the same like I had before. That hasn't changed, so I just plug those in. And I put xy now times the joint PDF. Okay, so let's see how this works out. So I'm going to plug in um, the limits on x from minus square root 1 minus y squared to plus square root 1 minus y squared. And now I'm going to get an integral, which is going from minus 1 to 1. Again, I have a half 1 minus y squared minus a half 1 minus y squared times y times 1 over pi dy. This actually equals 0. And it turns out that's the same as this product. Okay? So it turns out it's the same as the product of the marginals, but in this case, x and y are dependent. So it's possible to get factorization in the expectation even when things are dependent, but it doesn't mean, so in the other sense, it doesn't mean once I factor some particular function that they're independent. Okay, so let's try a different function here just to see that it doesn't always work out like that. So what we're going to do now is we're just going to compute e of x squared and e of y squared. So it's going to be the same kind of integration limits. So those are just going to be consistent throughout this problem. Now I'm going to have x squared times the joint PDF. Okay, and I'm going to go ahead and plug in those integration limits just to see what kind of number we're going to get. Okay, so I'm going to plug those in and this time because I have x cubed, the sign in the integration limit is going to be preserved. So I'm going to have 1 minus y squared to the 3 halves minus minus 1 times uh, this 1 minus y squared to the 3 halves, okay? So if I just keep going with that, it'll turn out I have 2, -third, two over 3 pi times 1 minus y squared to the 3 halves. If I use some kind of um, symbolic integrator, I'll get 1 fourth. And then I'll, by symmetry, have the same for e of y squared, because you can just look at this circle and realize that the integral in either direction will be the same. Now let's try to calculate the expectation of x squared y squared. I'm just plugging in the same thing, same integration limits, but now I have x squared y squared. I'm going to save you um, all the work and just tell you by, you know, symbolic integration, whatever computer you like, you get 1 over 24. That's not equal to a fourth times a fourth which would have been the product of e of x squared and e of y squared. And so we see that because x and y are not independent, so x and y are dependent, there are going to be functions where I cannot split up the expectation of a product. This was one of them. It just so happened that e of x, y split up nicely, but e of x squared, y squared did not split up. So I always have to be careful. And we'll see more about why these kinds of things happen in a later video.